Okay, we are live. So welcome everybody to our weekly Tuesday afternoon live stream. Uh, this week, I am your host, Dana Morningstar, and with me is the lovely and talented Angie Atkinson. So Angie, welcome. Hello, thank you. Happy to be here. Oh, we're happy to have you. So uh, if you guys are new here, um, if you'd like to be notified when we go live, oh, and I need to say something in the chat. So YouTube gets that going. Um, if you are new here, if you'd like to be notified when Angie and I go live or individually or as uh, a team, you can text the words Dana live to the number 22999, all one word, or Angie live, all one word to the number 33222. <laughs> 33222. I write it down every week and then I don't know what I do with it. Three. <laughs> Two, two, two. Okay. So um, with that said, we thought we would jump in to today's discussion, which has to do with spring, spring cleaning in particular. And this topic goes a lot deeper than you might originally think. So stay tuned and we will get into it. So Angie, uh, yeah, spring is almost here. I think everybody's excited about it. It's shocking to believe that it's been a year um, already. So since COVID and everything else was going on and spring is that time where we tend to do a spring cleaning um, across the board, people kind of tidy up their space. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about spring cleaning? Well, as we were, you know, we, we talked right before we went live here. And, and one of the things that came to mind for me was the fact that, you know, clutter is actually a symptom of our trauma or maybe a side effect of our trauma. Okay, now I've got my voice in my ear here. Um, <laughs> yeah, here we go. Okay, it's a side effect of our trauma. So what happens is it, it could be any number of reasons that it happens, but it, it comes down to the fact that we, f we feel overwhelmed. We feel, I, I guess I would ask this, how many of you in the chat, how many of us here today have ever struggled with clutter. Say me if you have in the chat. Um, I personally, I struggled with it a lot and, and I still have my moments because I have a little ADHD brain going on, mm -hmm. um, which I also think is connected to trauma in some ways. Um, but the, we see this a lot. I've actually gone so far as to, I have like a 30 day challenge for decluttering and everything because it's become such, a, such an issue for survivors. Um, Dana, have you ever struggled with clutter yourself? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and same ADD yeah. brain. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did fine. I was able to manage life effectively until I hit middle school. And then when things began to get more complicated, I think both in my emotional life, but just also the kind of the demands of school and everything, that was when everything spun into chaos. And it was this continual source of shame and embarrassment and frustration and mm -hmm. tears um, my yeah. brother was a hundred times worse than me. And, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, kind of pain around organization and clutter. And it took me until uh, I didn't start getting a, a handle. I didn't even know how to get a handle on it until I was in my late twenties. Right. And that's the thing that's crazy is that, and, and a lot of people still don't have a handle on it. I mean, I remember, you know, even like in college and even beyond, there were many times when, I thought like, I couldn't invite people to my house because I was it's such a mess. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I don't think I realized that it was connected to the trauma until probably three or four years ago, I was researching and I figured out that there is a connection and, and there's reason. It's not just me. Research has, has mm -hmm. proven this, you know? Um, so I, and I see in the chat here, people are saying, yeah, you know, their clutter, it was their way of holding on to Sarah said her identity and security. And I don't know about y'all, but <clears throat> pardon me um oh and una says just the opposite ocd and that's another way we tend to mm -hmm. go i think it also depends on how our abusers were uh because what i've noticed is that in my case i had a very ocd parent i mean i don't know if ocd is proper for in this case but just obsessively um obsessive about getting things about us getting things done you know uh, white glove behind the toilet to check for dust kind of thing <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean um, and I think what happened is that when I first because I felt so put upon by this uh, because it was an everyday multiple item list that I had to complete different things different days and 
it was a lot. And it it's, you know, I'm not saying it was wrong to, to give a kid chores. I think it's right to give a kid chores, but I think maybe, you know, to consider their other activities and their other responsibilities is important. Uh, but anyway, off topic, I think my point is we see this, we see people, I mean, I'm working with one client right now. We're doing this like weekend intensive thing where we talk six times a day for 10 minutes so she can go through her, um, you know, her clutter at, at, because she doesn't want to do it by herself. And and there are different, well, and it kind of goes back to being stuck, right? Have you been stuck in any, <laughs> I've been stuck. I'm sure you have too, where you just kind of can't do anything. Like, you know that you can logically get up and do something, but you keep looking at it and you're overwhelmed by it. Mm-hmm. It kind of takes over you <laughs> and you're just like, nope, like, you know, walking into a, a big messy room and being like, I'm just gonna walk right back out. I'll do this later. And mm-hmm. is it just me? <laughs> no, a hundred percent. That's very, very real. Um, you, you know, and if we don't realize that that's kind of that flight mechanism kicking in and, mm-hmm. and if we think, oh, well, we're, I'm just lazy. Yeah. Right. Like, what's wrong with me? I'm just that's lazy. Exactly or, what I thought. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, oh, I just keep procrastinating. Why can't I just buckle down and do this? And, um, you know, overwhelm is a very real thing. And mm-hmm. getting organized and kind of creating an environment that you love and that serves, that has kind of that that nice blend between form and function for you mm-hmm. uh, is not something that's consciously taught you know, and it, and it tends to be later on in life, like with your current client where things aren't working. And then it's sort of like, okay, you know what? Enough is enough. I need to get, I need to get some other help in here because I don't know where I'm stuck and why and how to get unstuck. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so yeah, clutter can, can absolutely be, uh, um, you know, I remember the realization, and again, this was probably, late twenties, early thirties of my external environment was a reflection of my internal environment. And, but also paired with the fact I didn't know how to get organized. It didn't click for me. And so I think that's kind of that ADD thing of instead of uh, kind of that natural ability to categorize and sift and sort visually and, and physically with items, it was just the sense of many, there's just many things here. And there was no ability to, to kind of categorize. And so having to be taught that, um, and that's kind of the added challenge too with ADD is it's, there is, everything is kind of compartmentalized. There's no transfer over effect. So whereas, um, let's say a, a person with ADD, especially a child, like they'd have to learn how to organize their binder. Mm-hmm. Then they'd have to learn how to organize their locker. Then they'd have to learn how to organize their closet. Then they have to learn how to organize their backpack versus a neurotypical person who is able to take that skill, that one skill of how to compart, you know, um, uh, how to categorize and they transfer it over kind of innately to different areas of their life. So this is why it feels like it's this uphill climb for people with ADD is because it is, it's, you have to restart it from ground zero every single time when, when you know, doing a new thing. So, and it's even, that's even true when you have had someone who's showed you or, t- or almost forced you into organization growing mm-hmm. up, because here's the other thing. I am a certain age <laughs> <laughs> and I cannot, I still like, logically, I understand the concept of organization, right? But it mm-hmm. is not something that comes naturally to me. And like, for example, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but if you go in my kitchen, it appears clean. And it is. But if you open the cabinets, it's ridiculous. <laughs> like it, I understand, again, logically how to intuitively organize the kitchen so that, okay, the, the spoons go next to here and that, you know, whatever, that the can opener needs to be in the drawer where the cooking goes on, <laughs> whatever. But, but it doesn't, doesn't make sense to most people. And, and the way that I have, I really should just pay somebody to come do it for me to set it up. Because once it's set up, I can follow the the pattern, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. but the idea of going in there and pulling everything out of the cabinets and reorganizing it is very overwhelming to me and it feels like too much. So I just keep my unorganized cabinets closed. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, or th- on that same note, 
organization might look different to us than it might look to your average person. So like I might have five piles on the table, but I know what's in each pile. And if you ask me for a certain piece of the paper, I know exactly where it's at. And ironically, I remember things like, here's an example, just uh, I was on TikTok the other day, this is stupid. And this woman was reading, literally reading my blog post off my blog as a TikTok, and word for word almost. And I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. So I went and I just, but I remembered, I wrote the post like five, three, three or four years ago. And I, and I was like, wow, but I have all that in my brain and I have everybody's social and everybody's phone number and all these things I don't need, but I can't figure out how to organize a darn kitchen cabinet. <laughs> Silliness. Anyway, um, my point is, I wonder if anyone else struggles in that way or Dana, do you struggle with like the, the concept of effective organization? I mean, I can straighten things out, but that doesn't mean that's going to work. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like, yeah. Um, some of the, the big things I've learned over the years that were just huge aha moments uh, was the need kind of thinking in terms of zones. Mm -hmm. So whereas yeah. before I was putting things away, but there was no kind of method to my madness. I was just putting things away. Yeah. And then I started thinking about things in zones. So let's say, for example, like there's like the gift wrap zone, mm. right? That's where you've got tape and scissors and gift wraps and bows and blah, blah, blah. That all goes in one spot or the kind of winter clothes zone or the shoe zone or the, um, and my cupboards at like a kind of baking supply zone. Um, and, yep. and so thinking of it in terms of zones helped and, um, uh, at, at the biggest thing for me is I, I can get very caught up, um, in whatever task I'm doing. And then there's kind of this degree of time blindness where I'm not aware of t the passage of time. I, I just don't track time like a, a neurotypical a person. Human. Yeah. <laughs> <Me either. laughs> and, and it's very disorienting. I mean, I used to really, this used to cause me a lot of struggle and anxiety and um, when I was younger. Uh, but it would, it'll be weird. Like I'll just clean out my car and then all of a sudden one day I'll go in it and it's messy. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, when did this happen? You know, I can relate. <laughs> yeah. And so, so, so kind of like uh, uh, viewing my behavior differently. So now I'm kind of aware of if I'm not, if I'm not grounded in myself or if I'm just kind of disassociating so much or I'm just constantly daydreaming or thinking about the future or dwelling on the past, then this is a sign that I need to slow things down because I can't handle, I can't manage what I'm already doing. Yep. Um, you know, and, and in terms of trauma too, it's, you know, trauma, it oftentimes it creates that fight or flight response and, um, and things can become very overwhelming. And some people in the chat were talking about all of, all of the stuff that comes up with our stuff, you know, uh, about Huffle mom was saying, oh, she struggles with keeping things clean because it's, um, um, she, she doesn't feel worthy. Yep. Yeah. She doesn't feel worthy of having a nice space. And, and somebody else was talking about, um, like you'd mentioned earlier, going to the opposite end of the OCD and yeah. with, when a person is traumatized, they, especially if there's abuse going on, um, they seek security and they seek control. And one of the ways that we do this, it tends to be a, like an unconscious thing. It's through our environment. Mm -hmm. And so this is where you get a lot of that anxious behavior where it's sort of like, I need my space to be a certain way in order for me to feel a certain way. Yep. Like in order for me to feel okay with life in the world. Um, or it's the opposite of everything is a mess because I just, I'm so overwhelmed. I can't handle anything and nothing is making sense. And it's, uh, you know, I kind of joking, jokingly refer to it as it's that feeling of having mashed potatoes for brains. Yeah. And I lived with that for like nine months and it's debilitating because just every, you know, it's like living in a fog. It is. Yeah. Um, one, one tip that has been very helpful to me personally that I have shared with a lot of my clients and probably on my channel at some point <laughs> is the one thing. And what I mean is, um, I have this tendency to look at the whole thing, the whole room, let's say, and, and go, oh, nope gotta go just turn around and walk out but what I've learned is that if I tell myself I only have to do it for five minutes some people will tell you 15 minutes but I can only I can only promise myself five minutes five minutes one thing so right now I'm looking around this room and I see that if I spent five minutes 
clearing the top of this buffet that's over here at the buffet table against the, I'm in my dining room, <laughs> the buffet table against the wall, it would look a lot better and I would be done with it and it would make the whole room look better. It's the only thing that's really bad in this room right now, the little clutter over there. And so for me, what I learned is if I stand up and I go five minutes and inevitably once I start when five minutes is up, I'm ready. I'm like, you know what? I can do one more thing. I can do one mm -hmm. more thing. And, I, and that's how I have to like sort of trick myself <laughs> into it because once I get going, I'm like, this feels good. And my house looks better and I feel better. So I kind of really do trick myself in, <laughs> into doing it. And then I, I listen to music really loud and sing along and everybody mm -hmm. just loves it. I'm telling you, they just keep coming. I'm just kidding. They hate it, but I, <laughs> they, they, they just go upstairs. It's fine. <laughs> But that it's one of those things though, like it helps me to want to keep going if I have music to get my body going. And then I promise myself that if I want to stop after five minutes, I can totally stop. And I never do, but I could if I wanted. And that's giving myself permission, which is not what I had, you know, growing up, I think I felt so controlled and so overwhelmed by, you know, this person that was telling me all the things. And there were literally like chore charts and craziness. So it was so one thing, do one thing and do it for five minutes or less and, and then be done. If you only need one minute, you know what I mean? If you, if you can't do five minutes, do one minute and you would be shocked at how much you can get done. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And you know, yeah. the added benefit to that is it's that it, it gets, it, it basically tiptoes around our amygdala. So yeah. it gets us out of that fight or flight because it's no longer, oh, I've got to organize my closet, right? right. It's no longer this monumental undertaking. It's, mm -hmm. I'm just going to kind of play this game, like beat the clock and see right. how much I can do in five minutes. And it is amazing how much you can really do right. a dent you can make in five minutes. And right. then it kind of becomes, it can become kind of this fun thing. Um, and then you build momentum Yeah, because it's like, you've just started. And so getting that's, there's so much resistance there uh, mm -hmm. when a task starts feeling incredibly overwhelming and uh, and there's so many messages that are, that we all have, I think, surrounding uh, cleaning too, right? Like you bring up the very valid point of, we can put music on, we can make it fun. We can turn on a podcast. Mm -hmm. And I think so many of us, you know, you grow up, especially if you've struggled with organization, it's, you're constantly getting in trouble for it. Yep. With your teacher, yep. with your parents, <laughs> with, you know, you're losing stuff. Maybe so with friends, you're returning stuff yeah. late or it's broken or damaged. Library books. Library books. I, I how many like of those I, have I bought <laughs> oh my god I feel like I funded my whole public my old public library it was ridiculous um same yep <laughs> yeah you know so yep. kind of realizing like it doesn't have to be punishment right get organized like it doesn't have to be like this got to it can be this get to yeah and we can make it our own time exactly um, and like huffle mom notes here you know like you, you mentioned earlier her you know feeling she wasn't worthy that is something that can become a form of self-care and it really does have to do for me with the perception because <laughs> like i like we mentioned earlier previously you know growing up i was I, I had this perception that this, I was doing this for other people and I totally was <laughs> for, for this person who was raising me and anyone who decided that they were coming over, you know, I had to always keep up appearances. And so when I left that place and I went on, you know, to college, I, I, I think I felt like, oh, I have freedom now. I don't have to do it on the certain times and days. And I think as the years went on, I became less and less um, structured and, but with that being said, you know, now it's about, certainly I have certain routines that I do and little things like somebody was, JJ was mentioning in the chat earlier. Um, if you're, uh, so, oh, here it goes. You learn to clean as you go. You have a place for everything, even a folder for junk mail to look through in the spare time. You don't have dirty dishes after cooking. You do it as you see it. That is pretty much how I roll now. You know what I mean? Like I said, I have a little clutter on my buffet table over there, but it's mm -hmm. otherwise pretty good. I never have dishes in my sink because I don't, I'm almost obsessive about washing them right away because it takes two minutes. Whereas mm -hmm. if you wait a day or two or five, then it's a two hour job or a 30 minute job or whatever, then that's too much for me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I do find that that's a really effective is to kind of go clean as you go. And I, I love having a place for everything. Although I have to acknowledge and admit once again, that my kitchen is ridiculous with it, with the, with the things put in the wrong cabinets. So it's, <laughs> I need somebody to come over and organize those. But <laughs> that's another thing you can do too, though. If you have the ability to uh, financially 
to pay for someone to come help you organize or clean, you can do that. Or you can, you know, trade services with a friend, like, I'll babysit mm -hmm. your kids if you organize my cabinets, or, you know, you watch my kids while I organize my cabinets, and then I'll come over and help you do yours, depending on which side of the <laughs> thing mm -hmm. you fall on, right? Or whatever it happens to be. I mean, it, there are so many different ways you can uh, do that. If you have people who, in your life, who enjoy it, and it's just another helpful thing. So what are we going to, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, there, there's, so, there's just so much around, so much around that, you know, um, uh, Jack is, some people here are talking about kind of hoarding uh, items. And I, again, I think that tends to be a trauma response. Sure. Uh, it's kind of falls under that um, fortressing and it's that need to, it's that need to feel safe. And it's, it's also, I think, very tied into that attitude or that mindset of scarcity mm -hmm. of, you know, and I sympathize so much when I watch these kind of different extreme shows, I, you know, hoarders or anything like that. And I, man, it sometimes scares me because I, I get that mentality I get it. of, yep. uh, yeah, things have value, things have use. And just the thought of throwing all of this stuff away. I mean, it causes me anxiety. It's not even my stuff. I know. So, you know, um, yeah. but it's interesting. It can be an interesting exercise to kind of look around and to notice what you're hanging on to. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure men have this too, um, probably in somewhat of a different way, but I know for me and probably for a lot of women, um, my closet Mm -hmm. tends to be the zone of, um, <laughs> excess, <or just> uh, <laughs> denial. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's crazy when I, I went through everything, probably, I don't even know how long it's been seven years. Mm -hmm. It was before I started my YouTube channel and pulled everything out of my closet. I just had this freak out moment one day and got really clear. I'm like, what is this? I have clothes that do not fit that are, I mean, like we're talking five or six sizes away from fitting like there that those days I think are gone. Yeah. Um, you know, and not only that, but they're so out of style that even if I did lose the weight, really, am I going to go wear those clothes? Right. Um, and then on that same token, you've got the, the fact that clothes cycle in and out of st similar styles, you know, come through. And so you're like, well, wait a minute, these might be skinny jeans, but maybe in five years, they're going to come back. But guess what? It won't matter. You won't wear them anyway. <laughs> right. <even> if, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> even if you do, what do they say? What do they say? It's like, uh, if you wore it the first time around, you can't wear it the second time around. You're too old now. <laughs> or something like that, right? <laughs> well, that's a kind of an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of, like, well, yeah, I guess to, Some of it. <laughs> to make that point. Yeah. The kind of low, super low rise yeah. jeans um, that th th those weren't comfortable to begin with. Right. <laughs> and I, the, the, I don't ever want to wear those again, but I have I, all these clothes, the clothes of different sizes, clothes of who I thought I should be, mm -hmm. how I thought I Same. should dress. Um, clothes for a life that I have never lived that I think I bought out of some sort of daydream, mm -hmm. uh, cocktail dresses. Oh, me too. Tons of Oh them. girl, Ridiculous. I'm in bed by nine 30. Like, I don't know where I'm <laughs> thinking I'm going to go out for cocktails. <laughs> there was a time in my life when I had a need for cocktail dresses, but I do not anymore. And yeah. I have not in a long time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, there's yeah, just all kinds, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to kind of examine like, what are we hanging on to and why? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And it's hard to say, you know, that is an interesting point with the clothes. I wonder how many people have similar struggles with clothing because I definitely can relate to that. And I have the same deal. I mean, I need to just get rid of like three quarters of what I own in, in the clothing mm -hmm. department. And I feel like, you know, I'm too lazy to sell them. <laughs> you know, So I would, I would like to just give them to people but I don't know what to do with them. So I end up just holding on to them until I get around to it. So maybe that, maybe that's something we should, we should challenge each other to cleaning out our closets. Anybody want to join yeah. us in the closet cleaning? <laughs> I like the idea of doing that. Um, yeah. Kind of that push and being accountability buddies. Yes. Okay. We got to do that because we we'll really have need to, to talk. Do it. Yeah. We'll talk. I, yeah. You know, and, and another aspect to this decluttering mm -hmm. um, and people have mentioned in the chat that Marie Kondo method she's darling she's like japanese mary poppins yes um you know her whole message is does this spark joy i mean that's great but who has i'm sorry i'll stop <laughs> i do not have time to go through all that <laughs> with every object in my house 
But I'll tell you somebody who does resonate with me, and maybe you've heard mm. of this, Fly Lady. Do you know her? Flylady.net. No, no. Oh my gosh, Dana. Okay. She was perfect for me when I found her back in like 2007. Oh, wait. Okay. 2003, maybe, whatever my, yeah, 2003. She's been around. She's still around. And what she is, is she's this mama type, right? Like a Southern mama type who herself is a recovering, I don't know, I can't remember how she puts it, but she says she sidetracked home executive, <laughs> okay, <laughs> which is like this, uh, I, I haven't looked at her stuff in a while, but she, she has this whole system. And one of the things that she does that I really like is um, like a 27 fling boogie or something like that, where you can like, you grab a garbage bag and you walk around your house and you find 27 things as fast as you can to throw in the bag and get rid of. It could be trash. It could be anything, you know, and she does little things like that, but then she has these little routines you can go through. And her thing is like, look, you're never behind. Just jump in and right where you are, you're right where you are. You know, it's really mm -hmm. gentle and also a little bit of tough love, but not to the point that you don't, I felt nurtured by her <laughs> back then. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When I was, I, I found her when I was on maternity leave with my middle son, um, you know, so it's just interesting though, because um, that for me, Marie Kondo scares the crap out of me. I've bought her book. <laughs> I've tried to do her thing. Right. I don't have that. I'm not, I can't, maybe I'm just not getting it, but I can't sit in my house and go, does this spark joy for me? For I can't do it. <laughs> it's so bad. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not because I'm totally wrong. But, uh, but, and I know it works for a lot of people. And I love her idea of does it spark joy. And I do mm -hmm. kind of try to use that a little bit. But the, the fly lady thing for me is more like, okay, look, I know you're a slob, but um, here's a way that you can try to make your life a little better. And it really did change my life back then. It's totally free too. You can buy, you can buy stuff, but you can do the whole thing for free right through her website. She'll email you all the things. That's great. I mean, so flylady.net hmm. for anybody. I'm definitely not making any money off of talking about it. It's just something that personally worked for me that helped me a lot in that area. And that's how I kind of keep surviving and, and keeping my house relatively clean because of that mindset that I learned from her, which is like, look, nobody's perfect, but you can do things. And then she talks about like Huffle Mom mentioned, um, it's something you do for yourself and your family to make your life you know, because you, you deserve to live in a nice, clean home. And who does, you know, we all mm -hmm. want a nice, clean home. So I think that was really helpful for me. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you on that. No, but I just, no, that's okay. That's interesting. I've never heard of her. I will have to look that up. You really should. You will love it. Yeah. It's, you know, and especially for those of us who had toxic parents growing up, um, there's a gentleness about her that makes you feel like, almost I mean it's she's really good she almost makes you feel like she loves you a little bit even though she don't even know you mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry so yeah flylady.net all right sorry <laughs> what were you gonna say about Marie Kondo because maybe I should try her again tell me <laughs> well okay so here here's what I do like about the concept of mm -hmm. that does this spark joy is maybe maybe a better way to put this is is this nourishing for me yeah and um, another aspect to spring cleaning mm -hmm. is I and I I think this is very important is to look at our contact list and our phone. So it's not just items, it's relationships too. Oh yeah. Love and that. kind of figuring out, okay. And thinking in terms of relationships as seasons, mm -hmm. um, some, some relationships are going to be there uh, through all four seasons. And some of them are just there for one and kind of examining, okay, what relationships, what do I need to reshuffle? Um, do some of these relationships, are they, is it time to, uh, you know, kind of toss them out or is it time to uh, spend more energy cultivating them or kind of um, really getting clear with, with uh, kind of the people in our life? Like, is, is it quality or is it quantity? Mm. Because quantity, strangely enough, I think when people tend to go towards quantity and they fear kind of pruning back these relationships that are less than fulfilling, it's this idea of, I don't want to be alone. Um, uh, you know, kind of nobody's perfect. I just want, I just want all these other people around. But then the reality is that quantity of relationships, if none of them are really fulfilling, or if the vast majority of them are incredibly draining, mm -hmm. you're, it, it's profoundly lonely. Yes. So uh, yeah, kind of just examining, examining yeah. our life in all different facets. I think it's so powerful. And I think that when we do that, I mean, I like the idea of, of having like a set time each year to do that with the spring cleaning idea. That's really, really nice. I, I think mm -hmm. that's important. And I think, like you said, I mean, it could really, 
it, when we intentionally look at things and we realize like one of the things I'm about to do is I'm not sure if I'm going to use the trim app or one uh, or a different app, but one of the, I'm going to have one of those apps go through my, <laughs> go through my, all my accounts and figure out what things I'm paying for that I'm not using. <laughs> That's coming mm -hmm. really soon. I just have to find the safe one. Um, but, uh, and Maritza speaking on that same note, um, notes, I feel guilty because I spent a lot of money on things. It's such a challenge to let stuff go. It's part of organization to get rid of stuff. I say, thank you. Then let go. I like this. I like that saying, thank you. Then let go. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I can relate to that because there are things, I mean, some of the clothes that I keep around, I just keep them because I bought them <laughs> because I, I spent money on them and, and I think I might wear them, uh, you know, and there's been a couple of times where I went crazy and got rid of a whole bunch of stuff. And then, you know, a week or a month or a year later, I thought, where's that one shirt I used to have? And then, oh no, I got rid of it. Oh, that doesn't help. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but I do that kind of stuff. So um, I, I agree with that. And, but I do think it is part of you know, life. And, and so I keep reminding myself, myself, you know, it's only stuff. And that sounds small, but it, it means more to me because of, because of the fact that only stuff is um, like, it's just earthly stuff. Does that make sense? Uh, mm -hmm. friend, yeah. A friend of mine had her husband passed away and they, she went to a psychic and I don't know how legit that is, but one of the things that the psychic said that he said to her when she said, what about this? And what about this? And he goes, it's just stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's just stuff. So when I say that to myself, that's kind of where the uh, perspective I come from, like, it's just stuff. It, I, I don't need stuff right all the time. So, and maybe if I could give it to someone or, or even donate it to a, you know, an organization that will, will, will help someone with it, then I try to do that if, whenever I can. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's, um, I don't know who I picked that up from, but kind of that tip of, um, you know, well, like with a lot of the hoarding, they're like, oh, this has value. This has value. And they're like, oh, it's an old lamp. Just toss it. Or it's an old shirt. Just toss it. And, you know, I find it significantly easier to think about things in, term, in terms of um, uh, it serves a purpose, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes it sparks joy, but ideally it serves a purpose. If it still serves some sort of purpose, but it's not right for us anymore, like letting it go. And so somebody else can enjoy it. Yes. And I then realizing, that. oh, I think I really hope somebody else is going to love this. Then it's yeah. so much easier because then it's, it's like secret Santa yes. kind of a thing. Even, you know, even if I end up donating it and Goodwill ends up tossing it, the thought right. of, oh, I really hope that this, you know, really old office chair um, that somebody is going to be thrilled that they get to buy an, a great office chair even though it's 50 years old for five bucks right exactly you know? yep yep so. yep and I can't yeah absolutely I wish there were I wish there were a way that I could like ship things for free to people because I know a lot of people would use stuff that I might just get mm -hmm. rid of you know what I mean and like I would love to build but it doesn't work I, I'm too I'm too shipping is expensive <laughs> when you and don't it's so time you, consuming because then you've got to categorize everything I you know I've yeah. seen people doing Poshmark and um mm. and I'm thinking oh man that's a full-time job there's really people on YouTube that do the clothing hauls and then they mm -hmm. end up Poshmarking the vast majority of it and like oh yeah. that stresses me out <laughs> yeah for real just thinking about it no way totally yeah it's whew, it's a lot yes. I'm trying to see wait a minute Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. So I just got distracted by the chat. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. I'm looking for some. For Peggy questions. says quite a while ago, I saw the Marie Kondo method for folding clothes in our drawers in drawers immediately changed my drawers. All I could think was too cool. <laughs> Peggy, can we hang out sometime? You let me rub some of that rub off on me a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know, you know, in my <laughs> life. <laughs> This was one of my Marie Kondo moments. So she had, I don't think, I don't know if she still does, but she had a, like a season of a TV show mm -hmm. and it was, uh, her folding is just, it's, it does, it sparks joy in my heart. It's just so beautiful to open up a, a drawer. But I, I look at that. I'm like, Oh, I do not think I could maintain that. Like that's time intensive. Um, but so anyways, so during quarantine, one of my things I had, again, one of these mini freak out moments of, uh, kind of this existential crisis of like, what am I doing? And I'm all this time at home and I need to be doing something productive. And so I, then I decided I'm going to learn, damn it, to fold a fitted sheet. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> oh, 
I love it. How to go? Lots of trial and error. I think I I probably folded and refolded and did that a, a good at least I don't know a good fifty times um, before it it started to actually click. And now I actually really enjoy folding fitted sheets. It's um, I just I feel like a badass. Because <laughs> versus here's how I do mine. Wadding it up. That was. <laughs> <what I do. laughs> I kind of, you know, throw them together, but yeah, Mm -hmm. I'm just happy when my things get folded at all and put in (laughs) in a drawer. (laughs) So it's the best I can do right now. Yeah. But I do, I think it's really cool that people are, you know, and I I wish I was better. I did go through a thing where I I had these, (laughs) I do have a very organized underwear drawer. I'll just say that. (laughs) I got these little, little um, soft cloth things with little, um, Uh you know, holes, I don't know what they're called, cubbies or whatever. And you just like roll it up and stick it in there. It looks like flowers sticking out the top. It's great. <laughs> oh, that's cute. Yeah, it works. It's cool. Yeah. yeah. So that does spark joy for me, the silliness. Um, now, this is another problem that I have quite often is um, what uh, Fatima says, the smallest things distract distract me. That is the story of my life. I eat squirrel. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and so, yeah. Oh, and another thing that I've seen with myself and with a lot of a few of my clients that I've worked with on, on this particular topic is um, when you start like decluttering and it's like a serious declutter situation mm-hmm. and you find things like old journals or cards or letters or photo albums or whatever, what do you do? Do you, do you just go, oh, I'll look at that. Like, nope, you sit there and you look at it, right? You start mm-hmm. reading. Oh yeah. So that's a thing. <laughs> distraction um, which is why again I go back to the five minute rule all the time you know what I mean and and, mm-hmm. and it always helps it does like the other day I was stressing because my my child cooked in the kitchen and trashed the kitchen and my child was not cleaning up the kitchen and I could have screamed and yelled and acted crazy but that doesn't help anything so I thought you know what I'm just gonna go in there and clean it up really quick and here I thought, I turned on the music and I prepared myself for a four-hour job, but it turned out to be like a 20-minute job. You know what I mean? So I think we we tend to overestimate our, our sometimes, the messes. I don't know. Maybe it's just mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, I think um, uh, a lot of it, when it comes, when I think it comes to making any type of change, it's kind of getting clear on the why behind it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that way we're not creating a life that's just a giant to-do list, mm-hmm. that there's some sort of purpose yes. to it. And um, again, one of the, the aha moments for me um, um, was in, because cleaning and organizing felt very stifling to me. Um, I, grew up, I grew up in a home that felt very much like a museum. Um, it, it, it was very things were put away. It was not organized. I didn't realize that as a child, but I now as an adult, I really, but it was, everything was put away. I really never felt at home there. And there was a lot of cleaning and organizing. And I kind of realized now that my father, I think, um, had that OCD personality type. There was a lot of anxiety behind things. And anyways, so I picked up the message that kind of uh, cleaning and organizing was something that I was going to not be successful with that it meant I was in trouble there was a lot of heaviness and negativity surrounding it and then when I started making this shift and kind of getting things in order realizing because I think for a long time I'd been telling myself I don't have time I don't have time to be organized or to be super tidy or or whatnot and then I realized you know what I don't have time not to Mm. Like there's a lot of things that I want to do in this life and, you know, searching for things and, and kind of um, getting caught up in like the detritus of it all, the, the kind of unnecessary clutter is just slowing me down. And, and then when I kind of shifted my mindset on that and realized, okay, um, you know, this is my why, if I want my life to run smoother and I want, I want to, f- to feel good. I want to be able to come into my space and feel like to be able to breathe you know, and yeah. feel comfortable there. It feels better. Self-care, yeah. right? It's a form of self-care. A hundred percent. And same with relationships. Yep. Um, you know, with that aspect of it, of, yeah, <laughs> like I, I want these to be nourishing and, uh, um, you know, a place of, a place of comfort and a um, recharging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think one thing that always helps me, this is silliness, but it, it works for me. And I've, I've heard from other clients, from some clients, it works for them is to make rules for myself in relationships and in clutter and everything else. For example, in relationships, um, when I, uh, when I was single, I told myself I can't date anyone until, or, oh, I couldn't date until a year after I was divorced. And then I couldn't, or a year after I left. And then I couldn't mm-hmm. date anyone until, or I couldn't commit myself to anyone. I don't know. I had all these rules for myself for dating and for, for relationships. You know, it had to be a year before I would agree to any sort of next level after just going monogamous with a person or whatever. Um, and that helped me to to stay on track with not falling into a relationship too fast, um, which was my tendency to do. Um, and then with the house stuff, like uh, with the clothing, I try to be like, well, if I haven't worn it in a year, it goes <laughs> or, or whatever, you know what I mean? Or if I have, which is not always happening right now, but I guess I need to reinforce that rule. My point is when you make rules for yourself, it helps if you're the s- sort of person who who feels obligated to follow your own rules, which sometimes I do, <laughs> especially if I publicly state them, you know what I mean? That always helps. I mean, not publicly like on YouTube, but to other people in my life. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. So something. Okay. Let's see. Huffle mom recommends how to ADHD by Jessica McCabe. And I'm not sure. I think that's the one I like. Um, is she the younger girl? She's got real big eyes and she's uh, she's darling um I no she's her. like 30 but she looks like she's 14 yeah that's the one okay yes. and yep I, her I think channel's she's wonderful i, I absolutely yeah. adore her and everything she does same yes. i'm a subscriber she's cute yeah. um and not just cute intelligent and and gets it's it. the whole package yeah her totally. information her delivery yeah. her all of it yeah very I, good yeah okay let's see you got a comment or a question for us um, uh, it's kind of one of picking up here in the chat is all, it's interesting. All of this, this heaviness around clutter. Mystique mm-hmm. is saying clutter makes me distraught. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bonnie was saying clutter makes her feel guilty. Mm-hmm. A lot um, of guilt for that. A yeah. lot of guilt. Yep. Uh, Tammy saying yes, piles <laughs> and straightening mm-hmm. up is all about moving piles and <laughs> When yeah, you- <laughs> that's, that's a big one. One, again, one of my takeaways was the need uh, for every object to have a home. Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of one of my signs of pile, because I'm a pile person too. Yeah. If things are piling up and I look at that and I'm like, I don't know where these things go. It's because they don't have a home. Right. And so right. creating a home, you know, then once you know where things go, you know, where to put them away. You're not yeah stuffing stuff in drawers randomly right right yeah yep and that's where the um you know the I think for me anyway up to a point in my life I I didn't always have a place for everything and I so I tell myself that I place Mm -hmm. for everything everything in its place you know because that works for me it really does and Mm -hmm. I can I can follow it once I have it set up but it's you know so for example right now I'm about to put little shelves up in my you know I have a little half bath in my bedroom area and I I um, I'm about to put shelves up because I put on my makeup in there and so what I have going on is <laughs> all over the back of the sink the things that don't fit on the shelves on the side that I have already put up so I'm adding you know new shelves which not excessive but just a couple little ones to take care of the things on the back mm-hmm. of the sink <laughs> because I can't clean the sink if there's makeup on the back of it so <laughs> <laughs> you know mm-hmm. so everything in its place it's really important stuff um <laughs> yeah yeah Oh, Sarah Miller has, has seen fly lady. She said she got a bit annoyed at the amount of emails. And I think, I think that's a thing. Um, I also felt overwhelmed at some point by the emails. And so you don't have to always do that. All the emails, I don't think, but yeah, I think you could even go to the site and actually read through each thing. Um, like each would be email without actually subscribing, I think. So that's something else Hmm. to think about. Yeah. 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 Oh, and the thing that I liked about hers was, um, one of the things was, uh, there was like a, (laughs) She says chaos, C H A O S, can't have anyone over syndrome. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's cute. I think it's cute. And and she uh, anyway, there's one of her little drills that she has or whatever is, um, you know, like a 20 minute clean your whole house thing so that you know if people are coming over this, how you hurry up and clean up so they don't see your mess. 
you know, put things in laundry baskets, do this. She has this whole thing. It's so good. Um, and it's for, you know, when you are that sort of, where you, when you're in that place, something like this makes you feel more, you know, I think more supported. So anyway, I'm not trying to only mm-hmm. talk about clutter in the house, but yep. yeah. Let's yeah. It's, it's changing your relationship with your things in your life mm-hmm. and relationships in your life. Mm-hmm. And I think also a big part of it's changing our identity um, around those relationships with stuff and relationships to other people yep. and getting clear about that. Cause we tend to rise or fall to, uh, to the kind of subconscious messages or the limiting core beliefs we have about certain things. Mm-hmm. So if that, if that limiting belief is I'm not good enough, right. Or I'm not worthy uh, or I should be grateful for what I have. Right. But in the yep. sense of, therefore I shouldn't, Um, uh, therefore I'm somehow, I should be grateful for what I have. Therefore I'm not worthy to have nice things or new things. Right. Mm. Uh, It's going to involve working on that core belief because until that belief changes, we're going to keep, we're going to keep steering our behavior subconsciously into a way to where we, we meet that belief. We prove ourselves right. Yep. And I think another, a similar on that same line, you know, um, you know, they used to say that people, you know, who grew up in the depression would, would hoard stuff because Mm -hmm. they knew how it was to do without. And I think sometimes they pass that stuff on to the rest of us in some ways, because Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a mindset of lack or, or fear of lack, fear of not having what you need instead of a mindset of the, the mindset of abundance. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to talk about any of that, but what I am saying is on the, I, I did that. I, I held on to a lot because I thought, Oh, what if I need this? But mm-hmm. if I need this butter bowl with a, like my grandma with all her butter bowls, and anyway, she uses butter bowls for the, the lids, you know, for the leftovers or whatever. And I, I felt, I found myself keeping those and I just had a whole bunch of them that I didn't. So now I just buy them in sticks. It's yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, so yeah. Uh, JJ says, I learned young that having roommates, uh, to reduce expenses actually cost me more than doing it alone. And I definitely can relate to that. Um, but <laughs> because it's even just having kids is a pain in the behind when they think they're old enough to cook and not put away dishes, as I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but, but I can relate to that. Um, and Ren says, I absolutely love everything I have left. Not having so much clutter is free. And I feel that. I think that's an amazing and beautiful thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Michelle here says, uh, you know, it's shame. Uh, I've tried to avoid uncomfortable feelings for so long, including taking the time to clean or straighten things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It is hard and it is shameful. And, you know, that chaos that can't have anyone over syndrome is real, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, That was something that was big for me when I finally went no contact with my last narcissist. um, I which was a, a parent, um, I got to this place where I realized, you know, I don't, I want, I want to have a nice home and I don't, it's not because someone's going to judge me if I don't, it's because I just want that for myself. I don't want to feel stressed out when people come to my door unexpectedly. I would like to be able to invite them in, come on in, have a seat. Would you like some coffee? You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. I don't want it to be, oh gosh, I'm sorry about the mess. And I still find myself, even when my house is spotless, telling anyone who walks in, sorry about the mess, like almost like reflexively or, or, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, but I'm, it's not usually that that way anymore <laughs> so that's a plus little clutter like I said on on a surface here or there but it's nothing to to the nothing to the extreme and I, those hoarder shows they make me feel better about myself a little bit sometimes but I try not to watch them because I don't want to become that <laughs> anymore you know not that I was a hoarder but I don't want to become that and I think I think I I would only watch them if I was trying to inspire myself to clean out something <laughs> you know what I mean it absolutely lights a yeah. fire under me to, sure. to start cleaning and I, one of the other interesting I guess one of the reasons I tend to watch shows like that is mm-hmm. um there's one in particular it's like a, a British version of hoarders and they have this cleaning crew they are wonderful I don't know what kind of training program they go through but their whole staff is so compact I get like period they're just such beautiful human beings they're so compassionate and so loving and so supportive and 
um, you know, it can be frustrating being in an environment where you're basically seeing a bunch of illogical behavior, a person's holding on to trash. Um, it, it can be, it can be very activating and they do such a good job at just staying, you know, cool, calm, collected and supportive the entire time. And, you know, I, I kind of watch that. I'm like, man, I just, I would love to, to have more of that. Mm. Um, you know, and cause I, that's how we affect change. You know, it's kind of holding that space for, for other people to um, let their stuff, uh, kind of emotional stuff be their emotional stuff, but kind of walk that walk with them. So I don't know, they're, this whole- I think that's really cool. And I think they're, I mean, people, you know, you see all these professional organizers, but those types of um, people who have that type of compassion, actually, I just recently saw something and I can't tell you what it was, but I saw something where a therapist was going to homes to, oh, it was a movie had Sally Field in it. It was new. Have you seen it? It's like on Netflix or, or no. Hulu or something. Oh, I wish I knew the name of it. I'll, I'll remind, mm. I'll, and maybe somebody in the chat knows uh, where Sally is. <laughs> Sally Field's mother, the character she plays, her mother dies and she's uh, like left in the hoarder house that the mother died, you know, and so she, her brother hires a therapist to come get rid of the clutter and I thought that was a really great idea to a therapist that would do that for someone you know would come mm -hmm. to your house and help you go through it and in a way in probably in the way that you're you're talking about where they know how to be supportive and they understand on a, on a very deep level like exactly why a person might struggle with this and and they know how to be because of course in the movie the 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 brother and, and the sister-in-law or whatever were mean and hateful about it to her and and they just wanted to, her to get the stuff out of the house so they could sell the house which she of course didn't want mm -hmm. to sell so that didn't make mm -hmm. her want to move anything yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> so interesting yeah anyway yeah there's all kinds of stuff um bonnie is saying she says i can't stand going through piles of mail i would rather stuff the mail in bags and forget about it i can relate been there done that yeah but then i i, I this is the thing. I know if I go through the mail every single day and I, and I take the things that I have to throw away and I throw them away right away, even if I don't go through the things I need to keep, at least it's only those things and I'll go through them soon enough, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but I have, I have like a little special spot in a drawer for things like tax papers and things that I know I'm going to need again, for sure. You know what I mean? And then anything that I have to like, like activate or, <laughs> you know, pay or whatever, I stick in the back of my bullet journal and I have that with me all the time. So little mm -hmm. things, you know, um, again, not traditionally organized, but it works for me with my little. And that's, I think that's a big part of it is again, yeah. you know, um, I think kind of tying this back to recovering from abuse. Uh, so many of us in that process of becoming grounded in ourselves and mm -hmm. learning how to validate ourselves, it's so easy to kind of get swayed or knocked off base and organization is yet another way that that can happen where we think we read this book on how to organize or whatever it might be, or our, we have a, a very organized friend who shows us how they organize. But if it doesn't work for us, again, it kind of, we, we might find ourselves defaulting into those shoulds. Oh, but yep. it should work for me. And then there's all of this guilt and shame and heaviness and resistance and all of that. When the reality is uh, organizing your space to, to meet the needs of your life. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then kind of on that note real quick, mm -hmm. and we've talked about this before, but I think it's important to cover for new people that are here that kind of, the, and this is going to get a little bit woo woo, but um, you know, like kind of the energy of our mm -hmm. space Yes. and in stepping into your own after abuse is such a almost like magical time. It's kind of this, this, this window of time that is just so powerful. It, it really marks that transition from old life to new life. And so if you are in the same home that you had with an abusive person or that you experienced some sort of trauma, maybe not even with an abusive person per se, but like at a traumatic event, moving things around and kind of changing up the energy in your space can be very cathartic and, um, you know, very grounding. Yeah. And kind of to add to that, a lot of people that are more on that kind of codependent side of the spectrum, if we have a hard time saying no, we might also find that um, our, kind of our space is not our own. 
Mm. It's uh, things that we feel we should have in there or things, you know, family heirlooms, um, furniture we don't like or want or bedding, um, you know, that somebody bought for us. And we feel there's, there can just be all of this guilt and obligation around items. And so kind of getting connected to that of, does your space feel like an accurate reflection of who you are today? Right. Or who you want, the kind of the life that you want in the life that you want to live tomorrow. Yeah. And I'll tell you something else, just on a little side note. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know how anybody feels about Oprah, but I, I secretly or publicly, however you want to put it, love Oprah. Always mm -hmm. have. Anyway, <laughs> the thing is, I saw something, I don't know, it was five years ago or longer, maybe, where she got on one of her shows and she said, you know, your body, your house represents your body, right? So like, if you have a bunch of clutter, you probably have a little extra going on in certain ways, or you have some other issue, maybe it's not overweight for you, maybe it's some other illness, or, but you know, basically your house goes as your body goes, and your life goes, or something like that, your mind, all of it's connected, and I kind of like that, it's on, on the same lines as, as you mentioned, I kind of like the idea of that, because then I thought, well, and it's really true. If you spend, you know, let's say a whole weekend cleaning your house, even if you don't get it all done, you will most definitely see a big difference. Even if you, like I said, five minutes sometimes makes a difference, you know. So uh, one of those things that that fly lady talks about is, for example, her thing is a shiny sink and you always have a shiny sink. And so you always do your dishes, you always wipe out your sink and shine it up. And it's, it makes you feel like there's something clean in your kitchen mm -hmm. and it works. I do that in my bed is my shiny sink of my bedroom. And so I always yeah. make my bed and make it all pretty. You know what I mean? It makes the whole room look better. Little things <laughs> um, like that. And then we have a couple of really good tips I want to share with you out of the chat. Um, okay. Uh, Ren Spencer says, I won't pay for things on impulse. If I want it, I have to wait 10 days and examine if I still think it will truly meet a need. I really like that because I need to probably take that into account in my own life <laughs> because mm -hmm. I'm not that way. I'm like, oh, I want that. Let me get it. Bing. Got it. <laughs> you know, and then, then even worse than that, sometimes I'll not know for sure which thing I want and so I'll buy three things or I'll find mm -hmm. a shirt that I like and I'll buy it in all the colors. <laughs> it's bad. I love that. What that that's a great suggestion. Wait ten days. If I I'm gonna try to wait two days. Yeah. <laughs> Baby steps. And yeah. one more. <laughs> uh, one more tip. Faith says, um, if you want to throw something out but you feel an emotional attachment, take a photo of it. This works for me. I can look at the photo. That is the truth. Um, and especially with things like your kids schoolwork and artwork and things like that I mean obviously you might want to save some of those things for sentimental value but you know maybe minimize it to a, a few items per school year and then anything else that you you feel guilty throwing away or you like I I can't tell you how many worksheets and and things like that I've thrown out because what am I going to do with those I'm going to keep them no but but then there are other th art projects things like that and but with three kids over the course of this many years you know there's a lot and so I agree with that statement take a picture and that's just one type of thing but you could do the same thing for other you know holiday cards or even outfits or clothing that you really like but you could, you don't fit or your kids grew out of or whatever take a picture and then get rid of it it really is a good idea mm -hmm. and then you, you can even set up like a what is it shutterfly or something a backup account for your photos somewhere else google drive whatever iCloud <laughs> good, mm -hmm. good tips yeah Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, with mementos, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, it's, I think, kind of finding a few key items that you really enjoy. And then, um, you know, I've seen, for example, I've seen people that have turned their wedding dress into like a pillow, like a pillowcase. Mm, I love that. And I know. I thought that was a really cute idea. A or idea. like you could make it into a picture frame, mm -hmm. um, like a fabric picture frame or something yeah. um yeah. or uh, you know like I when my dad passed um I I called it grief cleaning I had so much energy and it was just such a stressful time that I had to to do something and I mm -hmm. really if I had any doubt before <laughs> I didn't after that moment um realize I um when I have stress and anxiety, I stay busy. That's my way of kind of discharging that energy. And so I called it grief cleaning and ended up, we just went on this whirlwind, organized their garage, organized their whole house. My stepmother was very gracious and I hope I didn't overstep too many bounds there, but I just, I had to do something. And, um, and you know, one of the things that they tell you when a person dies is basically don't do anything for a year. Mm. 
And while I think there's value in that, um, at the same time, I realize the, the more time that goes by, the more difficult it's going to be to pass, to part with some of these items, to part with all of these items. Cause then they're all going to have this emotional significance. And I don't want to try to do this in the next five years. Like I, I, feeling motivated to do it now. And so anything that even there was doubt about um, um, donating, it just went in a, it went in a bag and it went in the garage. And so then I'll look at it again, you know, when we're there and it was, it was very productive and it was really cool because we were able to take those items that were significant and, um, and we rearranged kind of this game room upstairs so it's now that it was a place that was never used before. Mm. And now it's kind of the family hangout area. That's awesome. There. And it is awesome. Yeah. So, Very good thing. Yeah. Kind of thinking about special objects mm-hmm. um, like that. Like if they're so like, what does that sound like? Kind of don't wait for special occasions to use the fine China. Right? Yes. Like if you have things that you love, like why not now? I agree. You know, that was a hard one for me too, because I, I grew up Mm -hmm. always being told, well, you know, the China was never used, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, that was the same thing with clothing, you know, like I'll, I'll buy clothes and I'll think, oh, I'll never wear this, but then I'll, (laughs) if I really want to wear it, I'll wear it around the house. You might catch me in a cocktail dress one time, you know, you don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Yeah. It's fun. (laughs) But, but really though, it's, it's, that's, I, I love that. And I think it's so true. We all do that. I think up to a point we go, I'm going to save this for something special. And then we end up, you know, like there's that bottle of champagne. I have two in my, in my cabinets. I'm saving for something special. Not really. They're just there, Um, whatever it is, but somebody told us it was special or we had it in our mind that we weren't going to use this unless, and then we'd never use it. That's bad. Use your special, use your special things, people. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question from Samantha. I don't know if you have time. I was looking, I was just going to say that. Yes, go for okay. it. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, and she says, how do I ask for someone to respect my boundaries without causing offense to them and becoming rude to me, please? I'm always mindful of being polite. What are your thoughts? Well, okay. So here's the thing with that is all we have control over is how we assert our boundaries. Yep. So we only have control over being, being tactful about that. Um, so in what I say, being tactful, using I statements, yes, right. Like, um, um, oh, you know, I, uh, this, this new schedule, uh, this isn't, this isn't going to work for me. Um, it's making it about you, not necessarily about them. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is basically, this is somehow not okay with me, or could we do X, Y, and Z instead, or, um, Um, And it depends on the, you know, the person and, and kind of all of that, but it's also shifting our understanding of boundaries, realizing it's not about punishing them. It's about self-protection. So it's about guarding and valuing your space, your time, your energy, your emotions, all of that. So we can say things politely and, um, and have good intention, but then we have to let go. And so because we don't have control over how that person perceives it. If it's a person who's more on um, kind of one of the the takers of the world or a person that has a high degree of entitlement or narcissism, any boundary you set, no matter how polite you are, is going to seem, they're going to feel like that's mean and cruel and abusive to them. So kind of, I guess, parsing out what do you have control over and what do you not have control over? And, um, and then realizing that you're not responsible for their feelings. Mm-hmm. You know, all That's we can hard. do, it is yeah. very, it's mm-hmm. being incredibly difficult, especially if they do get frustrated and angry. And our intention is not to punish them. It's just to say, I'm sorry, I can't, um, you know, I can't, uh, I don't know, buy a Girl Scout cookies this year, or right. I can't uh, travel to see you for whatever reason, yeah. um, you know, and they get, they get hurt. It's just, right. I think it's, I I agree with everything you said. It's about being tactful and specific. And something that really helps me in that situation is to recognize that the few minutes I'm going to be uncomfortable during that conversation and after they end. But if I'm holding on to the need to keep everyone happy around me, and Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm rude to people. I'm never rude, very rarely, unless I'm forced to be. And it's very rare. 
I, I can't even remember the last time I was rude. <laughs> um, but it's about it's about being um, able to push through the discomfort and, mm-hmm. and sometimes getting uncomfortable for just a minute saves you a, like a whole world of discomfort. You know what I mean? So being okay with, okay, look, I'm sorry, but I can't do it right now. And oh, fine, oh, just breathe through it or turn around and walk away. You are not, as, as Dana said, and as Liza here in the chat said, you do not have control over how other humans behave. Sometimes we just have to push past it and get through it. And your priority should be to enforce your boundaries, respectfully, but not to take care of the feelings of someone who would not spit on you if you were on fire. That's Mm -hmm. all. (laughs) And that's a very valid point. You know, for somebody, uh, uh, you know, kind of that ability to be tactful and uh, kind of solutions oriented, team oriented, if the other person has, uh, is dangerous or destructive, you don't even need to communicate a boundary other your silence or physical distance or restraining order is the the you communicating your boundary so you know i'm talking about kind of everyday relationships people at work at coworkers, or um, family that um, there is that level of respect and mm-hmm. kind of workability present um because like angie was saying i think you bring up a great point Ange. Th- the level of discomfort whenever we try to negotiate situations with niceness Mm -hmm. or politeness, it's generally in an attempt to avoid discomfort. And the reality is it's, there is no getting around that level of discomfort. Either we face it now or we, it grows and then we face it later. Yep. It's the truth. And it took a long time for me to realize that. And I, it, it did not start. It started, it started with, my mother, I think, because I got to the point where I felt so obligated to do whatever she wanted that I literally gave my children two middle names, <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. each. <laughs> uh, and and so then I got to this place where I asked myself, like, what's going to happen if I say no? What's going to happen mm-hmm. if I don't do this? Well, I would go through some discomfort. She would be mad, but then I would not have to do it. <laughs> you know, I'm an adult. I shouldn't have to do everything someone else, you know. So it is, it's just a matter of taking, take a deep breath and push through that because it's this big compared to, you know, the big thing that they really want from the boundary they're trying to cross, you know, and you'll feel stronger mm-hmm. and better each time you do it. And they will become less and less reactive in my experience until, well, <laughs> most of them, some of them will, will do horrible things. Just watch yourself. (laughs) So that's a weird thing to say. Moving on. My mother did something bad when I got mad at her. Uh, The final time that I got mad at her, she contacted CPS in a revenge call because I Mm. didn't do what she wanted. And so, um, but that situation was very specific and unique. And she was doing the thing that she knew would hurt me without a direct hit. Mm -hmm. she thought they would keep it a secret that she called (laughs) so Mm -hmm. but then they came and they did the thing and found out none of it was true and so of course I learned (laughs) yeah so yeah yeah it it can be helpful too if we're if we are um um so fearful of confrontation or conflict Mm -hmm. asking ourselves okay what are we afraid of because more often than not it, it is it, it immediately we go back to when we're young and where you know oftentimes at least kind of with our generation kids weren't allowed to have boundaries you weren't allowed to be sad you really weren't allowed to be angry you weren't allowed to negotiate you weren't al- you were just um you know kind of seen and not heard kind of a thing yep. you had to go you had to go along with uh, your parents in order to get along or else Mm -hmm. there were consequences, but realizing as an adult, we have power, we have control, we have the ability to, uh, if we're being treated in a way that we're not okay with, we have the ability to get up and leave, you know, we don't just have to sit there and take it. And so kind of, um, so kind of making that unconscious thought pattern uh, behind that fear of confrontation, conscious of okay, what am I afraid of? Okay, well, maybe it's that they're going to be mean to me and then following it through. Okay, well, then what? Right. What if they they get huffy? What if they roll their eyes? What if, um, you know, they don't want to kind of meet you halfway and then being like, okay, well, this is how I would handle that. Yep. 
and then, you know, and then kind of just keep going with all, f- follow that bunny trail, what keep following all the what ifs. And then, then you'll know, because then, then it kind of puts a, a face onto that monster. And then you're like, oh, you know what? I can handle it. <laughs> um, I can do yep. this. Mm-hmm. I I have a detail for you really quick from Samantha. She says, um, for example, her neighbor kept putting all of her week's worth of rubbish into her, (laughs) must be British, rubbish bins, (laughs) not Mm -hmm. in any way. Rubbish is such a better word than trash. Um, (laughs) Yes. Causing them to overflow. It was bothering me. She wouldn't even ask for us, just did it. Um, In this case, if you don't feel comfortable talking to the neighbor, I mean, you could definitely reach out to the garbage company or the rubbish company (laughs) or the landlord or uh, I don't know someone like that I, I think I would um tell someone because that's costing I, I don't know what your situation is over there but I know where I live it would cost me more money to have more garbage cans filled and and also would really put a kink in my ability to throw away things <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's not funny but I would it, I would definitely mention to your neighbor if you sh- if you're sure she did it um, but in that case you might even tell someone else in an authority position right like you're if you live in a you know, have a homeowners association or a neighborhood, you know, watch thing. I don't even know what it would be in where you live, but that's a thing that you could look at as well, possibly. Um, any thoughts on that, Dana? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, it depends if you're renting, if you own, it depends on your neighbor. Um, um, you know, it's kind of like the saying goes that givers need to set boundaries because takers won't. And so, you know, kind of making it known, uh, asserting yourself to them um, of, hey, uh, you know, I don't mind every now and again, if you put like a, a garbage bag out here, if it's empty, but, uh, you know, when it's full and I can't even throw away my own stuff, you know, then there's an issue. So uh, let's, you know, either please don't use my stuff or if there is an additional cost, I, I, it just depends on what your situation is. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I realize we're a little over time. I don't know what your schedule looks like today. Um, let me know. Do you want to? <laughs> Changing my life also loves the word rubbish. <laughs> yeah, that is a good word. <laughs> a better word. Better word than trash or garbage. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Do you want to each do one more question? Then sure. we'll wrap up. Mm-hmm. You okay. got one for us? I am looking here. I thought I had one a minute ago. Now it just scrolled up. Um, I saw one from, from, uh, Jack. I'm trying to find it. Eh. <laughs> okay. Oh, here's a good a comment from, um, Ren. She says, I learned it took 40 plus years that people don't respect my, ba- people who don't respect my boundaries. This is good. Don't respect me as a person. I backed away saying clearly show respect or I cannot be with you dealing with narcissists is harder but but that's a valid point and I'll tell you something if you can become that strong which is something I currently I believe (laughs) I'm pretty sure I'm currently there um but if you can be that strong where you can say you know what and I know Dana we've talked about this a lot people who don't respect us people who don't who do try to constantly walk over our boundaries or push them back I think both of us are like, "Mm -mm." (laughs) you don't get to be in my life. And I think that's probably part of the reason I'm relatively sane today (laughs) is that exact reason, because I don't tolerate people who would do that to me. And it, it's not always just narcissists, even, even non-toxic people have done, you know, have made mistakes or, or taken actions, not out of a, a desire to hurt me, but out of a desire to, have something help them or, or to get something I have, or, you know, that I, you know what I'm saying? Like, for example, I years ago had a client who would never stop at the end of the session. And I had to literally get to the point where I had to start having my office people bill for over overages. And I hate to do that, but it's the only way that I could get people to respect that boundary. You know what I mean? Um, and so this one, only one person was excessive about it. And I haven't worked with that person in a long time, but they were not a narcissist as far as I could tell. They were just someone who was very needy and mm-hmm. needed, you know, to keep going. So uh, it, the point is sometimes we have to, like I said, get a little uncomfortable and, and that's hard, but it's important to respect ourselves enough and to recognize, as Ren said, 
you know, the people who don't respect our boundaries don't respect us. That's a big, important thing to remember. So, mm-hmm. yeah. 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 A hundred percent. And, um, you know, and kind of going back to like shifting our relationship or kind of those core beliefs about boundaries, fully realizing that boundaries, uh, are, if a relationship has any possibility of mm-hmm. being nourishing and uh, fulfilling, it's going to be because of e- each person's boundaries, not in spite of them. Mm-hmm. So this involves this full shift because I think a lot of us for a long time, our toolkit with keeping relationships going had to be uh, involved using politeness and niceness Mm -hmm. and a lot of ingratiating behavior. Sort of like, oh, I'm just going to go with the flow. I'm going to go with the flow. I'm just, you know, going to kind of keep this people pleasing going. But then, you know, uh, it's that growing dissatisfaction and resentment inside of us because we're not getting our wants and needs met and we're kind of just getting steamrolled right. all the time by other people who might not even realize that we're, they're steamrolling us because we're not saying anything. Right. So uh, it's kind of shifting more into that adaptive adult response to things. And, uh, um, you know, and it's, it's so freeing when you're able to cultivate those relationships with people who do uh, that you can be assertive and they can be, there's that assertive two-way communication, right? And people can talk about things openly and people are uh, team oriented and solutions oriented and uh, communication isn't being delivered out of anger. It's being delivered out of like, hey, just kind of FYI, you know, this is my boundary, this does or doesn't work for me. And, um, you know, it's, it keeps a relationship resentment free and it allows allows it to grow absolutely yeah so could not agree more and frankly it's the best narcissist repellent out there isn't it so yeah so it's making that shift from instead of relying on expecting or hoping other people to treat us appropriately Mm -hmm. or to 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 be good to us that we are good to us. And we know when we're being mistreated and we know when we're be- when our boundaries are being respected yes. and we're able to toe the line, it takes off so much pressure because then there's no, there's not this feeling of hypervigilance or anxiety of, um, um, you know, hoping that we don't come across more narcissists or whatnot. It's like, you know what, we come across, we come across yep. and we'll just keep setting boundaries. And if they keep pushing them, then we're done. Absolutely. I agree hundred percent. And on that same note, Kimberly says, I was going to add this, anyone calling me mean or having limits, excuse me, for having limits or saying no, are usually manipulating and that I don't need anymore. So she just walks away from those people. And I totally agree. I think when it's a situation where you can, you can do that, then you do it. And even as Shastina says, it's hard when it's your adult kids, it shouldn't be, but it still is for me. I get it, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I also know for sure that you, you know, you've got to put those boundaries in place and it is okay to say, you know, I still love you, but you're not allowed to come over to my house and use my kitchen again <laughs> or whatever, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? come over, I'll cook for you instead or something, <laughs> but yeah, it's another story, another day. So, yep. Anywho. Yep. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Well, this was a really interesting chat. I'm glad we, uh, dove into this it's amazing how much is there in terms of spring cleaning and making our space our own making our life our own um, trauma and organization and mindset my goodness I Mm -hmm. had no idea it was going to go that deep and I'm I'm so glad I just appreciate all of your your insights and um, information and everybody here in the chat same great comments great feedback and so much yeah uh, good stuff this it was fun. We should do this again sometime. Oh, wait, we will next Tuesday. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> do your thing. <laughs> so, uh, yes, Angie and I, we, this is something that we try to do every Tuesday afternoon, 1 mm-hmm. 30 PM Eastern standard time. And, uh, if you would like to be notified of when we go live, you can text the words Angie live, all one word to the number three, three, two, 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 or, and or Dana live, all one word, to the number 22999. And you will get text alerts of whenever we go live. Um, 
And what, what is our email address? Oh, it's livestreamtuesdays at gmail.com. Okay, yes. Our shared email. Yeah. Yes, our shared email. So if you guys have any questions that you or topic ideas or anything that you'd like discussed on a future uh, live stream, you can email us and uh, we'll go from there. So That's Angie, good. thank you again so much for your time. And My pleasure. I'll Thanks to that mod week. squad. By the yes, way. for sure. Yeah, you guys are awesome. Thanks, Mod Squad. And um, did I mention that we switch channels every week? I don't know. If I, I don't did. know, but tell them again, just in case. Okay, okay. <laughs> we alternate channels. So next week we'll be over on Angie's channel, uh, Angie Atkinson on YouTube, across the interwebs. And uh, yeah. I'll see you then. Okay, take care.